It is late November, early December of 1963, and the United States Military Assistance Command, Vietnam, or MACV, has just published its Directive 88. And that Directive 88 is a uh, directive on measurements of progress and effectiveness uh, to be used um, by American advisors um, in Viet uh, serving in, in South Vietnam at the time. It is basically a laundry list of roughly 100 or so indicators uh, that are supposed to be used by Americans to help assess the war effort, not only for um, uh, the Assistance Command Vietnam, uh, then under uh, General Paul Harkins, uh, but also the U.S. Embassy. So I thought what would be best tonight, <clears throat> I've got uh, uh, about 100 or so PowerPoint slides. I'll go through each one of those indicators, and I think that that would by the time we get to slide 75, no, I will, I will, not, uh, I will not do that to you this evening. What I would like to do to, uh, tonight is, is talk about how the U.S. Army uh, attempted to go through that progress. And I say attempted because ultimately I think uh, the Army as an organization uh, actually failed in its attempt to, to accurately measure how well it was doing in a very different conflict than, uh, than it had fought uh, in, in its recent history. Um, and, and what I would like to propose tonight is that the difficulties that staff officers and commanders found uh, in trying to assess their efforts in this unconventional and conventional environment, um, and in, an, in a not only military environment, but political, social, and economic environment, and well, all impinge the course and conduct of the American effort in Vietnam. Um, and, and I think provide some, uh, unfortunately, in, in a way, provide some insights that are, that are useful for today in terms of uh, how we are still attempting, I believe, to, to measure our progress overseas. Now, um, I, I think the best place to start is to kind of confront a little bit of, uh, of the rhetoric, if not myth, of the war. Most uh, conventional histories of the Vietnam War argue uh, that the U.S. Army maintained uh, ex almost exclusively, a, or followed exclusively, a strategy of attrition. Uh, that the U.S. Army, especially focused under William Westmoreland, the commander of MACV from 1964 to mid-1968, uh, focused solely on killing the enemy, and therefore the sole measurement of progress for the war was the body count. And I think that uh, um, is a bit overly reductive, in fact, and the reality is actually this, that in its attempts to measure its progress and effectiveness throughout the war, the U.S. Army, in fact, uh, did not rely solely on one metric, but actually became overwhelmed by numerous um, hundreds and hundreds of metrics uh, as they tried to assess their efforts in, in multiple venues of the war, multiple programs that were um, were being implemented by the U.S. Army in Vietnam. And if you take a look at some of the measurement of progress reports that were um, being used at the time, they, they didn't focus solely on uh, the conventional conflict, as most histories would have you believe. In fact, those monthly ref reports covered innumerable aspects of the war. Um, force ratios and incident rates were certainly part of it, weapons losses, but also security of base areas. Um, roads, population control, area control, Hamlet defenses, and what I want to do tonight is kind of discuss how the Army went about that and ultimately why I think it failed. So I think the main effort, or the main argument I'd like to make tonight is that the Army in fact failed in its efforts to, to effectively measure how well it was doing in Vietnam, I think really for two reasons. First off, I, I think it's overstated that most Army officers during the war did not understand counterinsurgency. I, I think that um, is too simplistic. I think actually Army officers in the late 1950s and 1960s actually did appreciate the complexities of counterinsurgency warfare, and when they deployed to South Vietnam, uh, genuinely tried to implement programs that appreciated the complexity of the war effort. The problem is, in, in, all the le in all the doctrine and all of their experiences to date, there wasn't anything they could hang their hat on in terms of how armies in the past, whether it was Americans or French, um, measured progress in this type of environment. Secondly, um, because there was this lack of, of, uh, of knowledge um, and really experience about how to measure progress in this type of environment, uh, what compounded that was the, this 
broad and oftentimes uh, um, conflicting strategy in Vietnam. And again, what I'd like to argue tonight is that the Army did not operate solely um, under a concept of attriting the enemy forces. It was much broader than that. And in fact, that's where I'd like to start tonight is kind of work my way back into or back my way into the metrics piece by talking about strategy first. Now, because, the, uh, because the, there's not a lot of experience in how the Army is measuring its progress and effectiveness because the strategy is so complex, I think what happens is that the Army will follow the advice of Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, who argues in, in the early 1960s that anything that is measurable should, in fact, be measured. And what happens for the Army as they attempt to follow that advice is they become overwhelmed with data and so much time is spent on data collection that very little time is spent on data analysis. Now the way I'd like to approach it tonight is, uh, is after talking about the problems uh, of strategy and how this relates to um, the difficulties of measuring and assessing your, your operations in this type of war is to really uh, look at this through three different lenses. We'll talk uh, first about the body counts because I do think that is an important aspect of it. We'll talk about how the Army tried to assess its pacification efforts, efforts certainly an important part of, uh, of strategy in Vietnam. And then finally, uh, we'll take a look at how the American Army, especially in the latter years, attempted to measure the progress of its allies, the South Vietnamese Armed Forces, as, uh, as the United States forces were withdrawing. Now, as I mentioned, uh, I think it's important to first answer the question, uh, in, in order to answer the question of whether an institution is effective or not, we must first ask the further question of effective in the pursuit of what purpose. Now, according to the 1962 MACV mission, again, MACV is the Military Assistance Command Vietnam, according to the 1962 mission statement, um, MACV was uh, tasked to assist and support the government of Vietnam in its efforts to provide for internal security, to defeat the communist insurgency, and to res resist overt aggression. So right there, I think, there's some problems within a, a, a fairly broad mission statement that MACV is being asked to help its allies and, and ultimately help the South Vietnamese government deal with an internal insurgency, deal with roughly, um, um, deal with uh, population security uh, problems, and then also to resist overt aggression. So that mission statement in and of itself is, is fairly broad. And we'll, um, I'll show you that it actually becomes even broader when um, the Secretary of Defense uh, McNamara in 19, early 1966 will kind of delineate some tasks for William Westmoreland, who as you see here is uh, with Lyndon Johnson in, uh, in October of 1966. Now, this strategy becomes problematic in one sense because it is broad. And as the uh, two members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff will say in 1964, they're writing a memorandum to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Maxwell Taylor, at the time, and they're expressing their concern over what they call a lack of definition, even confusion, concerning American objectives and possible courses of action in Southeast Asia. Um, to put that in, I think, uh, a little more context, Julian Yule, who, is, uh, who will become the 9th Infantry Division Commander and ultimately a Field Force Commander in Vietnam, will say that the strategy of the Vietnamese War was so screwed up that it was, try it was like trying to win a war tactically, or trying to win the war tactically was like swimming up Niagara Falls with an anvil around your neck. This is a problematic uh, um, um, effort for uh, Americans just in terms of comprehending what they're supposed to do because it's so broad. Now, it, much of the literature uh, on Vietnam will contend that William Westmoreland, um, even in uh, the most recent biography on William Westmoreland, will contend that uh, this is an officer that doesn't understand his environment. He is uh, constrained by an army concept that is focused solely on its experiences in World War II and Korea, which makes uh, not only Westmoreland, but the entire army conventionally focused. Um, and therefore, because Westmoreland does not understand his environment, does not understand the social and political context of the war in which he is fighting, he therefore focuses on what he believes his strengths are, and that is firepower and maneuver. And therefore, he uh, undertakes what many traditional and uh, conventional histories will call a strategy of attrition. I believe that is overly reductive, and I believe it's, uh, it's, it's too simplistic. I actually think that what Westmoreland is trying to, to express with this idea of a strategy of attrition uh, 
is less about killing the enemy and focus on attriting enemy forces and more about expressing to not only his civilian leaders but also to the American public that this is going to be a long war. That this war will not be solved in a matter of months and in fact may not be solved in a matter of years. And I think Westmoreland understands that very early on. If you look at his concept of operations uh, that he, he writes in June of 1965, he's talking about things that are very familiar to us in the Army today, uh, that, those that have kind of, uh, I guess, more recently grown up on uh, the counterinsurgency doctrine that was, uh, was revised in the 2004 to 2006 uh, time frame. Uh, Westmoreland is talking about population security. He's talking about the, how the war will be won in the villages. He understands that the key problem here is linking the local population, especially the rural population, to the South Vietnamese government. He understands that there are limitations to what uh, American force can achieve when it comes to the bro this broad strategy. And I, I, I honestly believe he understands the, uh, the complexity of the war and doesn't focus, focus solely on attriting enemy forces. And unfortunately, I think um, in the last 20 to 30 years, if not uh, a little bit uh, longer than that, um, historians in particular have, have kind of centered on this word attrition and, uh, and then blamed Westmoreland for losing the war because he followed a narrow uh, strategy that was misinformed. Um, and what I would like to argue tonight, as you'll see here in just a moment, is that I think it was much more complex than that. Um, so he writes this concept of operations in, in June of 1965. In August of 1965, he issues his three-phase concept of operations. Um, and the first phase talks about uh, lasting through the end of 1965, and that phase is supposed to halt the losing trend. Uh, most estimates of uh, those in Saigon, Americans in particular, uh, as well as those in Washington, D.C., believe that if uh, the Johnson administration does not act in 1965, the South Vietnamese government will fall, the nation will fall. Um, and Westmoreland is tasked to go in, uh, and, and the decisions are made in, uh, in the summer of 1965, obviously, to deploy combat troops. I would argue that uh, much of the discussion during that time frame is focused on uh, or concentrates on um, how many forces rather than what those forces are supposed to do. Um, but Westmoreland, I think, is, is working through this problem in, in, um, in South Vietnam. And the task here is to commit these forces to halt the losing trend. Um, now, the military tasks here include securing uh, military bases, building up an infrastructure, and strengthening uh, the South Vietnamese armed forces. But again, uh, one of the strains you have in, in the literature on Vietnam is that Westmoreland uh, unlike his successor, Creighton Abrams, totally ignores the South Vietnamese army, and I, I don't believe that's true at all. Um, and then ultimately, Westmoreland in phase two will, will make a transition to conducting offensive operations. Um, and uh, not only will those offensive operations focus on enemy forces and the, uh, and the defeat of enemy bases, but also to provide an opportunity to, to uh, begin, if not continue, pacification operations. And I think what Westmoreland envisions is a, a sequential view for American strategy, that he's, uh, he believes he needs to establish some, sen some sense of security inside South Vietnam, and once that occurs, then the U.S. forces and its South Vietnamese allies can make this transition over to pacification tasks. And those pacification tasks are, uh, again, uh, intended to link um, the rural population to, um, to the South Vietnamese government. Now, as American forces are coming in in November 1965, uh, Mel Gibson takes his unit to the Aya Drang Valley. There's wonderful, tremendous uh, victory. It's, un it's an unprecedented, vi unprecedented victory, according to William Westmoreland. But there is debate over what the Americans are supposed to do next. And in February of 1966, um, Westmoreland meets with Secretary of Defense uh, McNamara meets with Secretary of State Rusk. Uh, Johnson, President Johnson is meeting with President Tu. And uh, what Westmoreland receives in uh, February 1966 is a list, a list of six tasks that he's supposed to accomplish to achieve his mission. Now, I'd like your, to, uh, to kind of go over these because I, I think they're, they're actually important for understanding the problems of measuring progress in this type of environment. The first task that uh, Westmoreland receives is to increase the population living in secure areas by 10%. All right, what does that mean? How do you define secure in this type of environment? Your definition of secure is probably different than my definition of secure. What does 10% mean? 
It's not until roughly mid to late 1967 that MACD actually has an, um, a fairly good estimate of how many South Vietnamese people are actually living in South Vietnam. They're still working through some issues on demographics. So just the uh, idea that they are supposed to increase the people living in secure areas by 10% is problematic at best. Second, to increase critical roads and railroads for use by 20%. What is a critical road? What is a critical railway? How do you define whether those rail uh, lines or road uh, networks are actually secure? Or if they are secure during daytime, is that enough? Or do they need to be secure 24 hours uh, a day, seven days a week? That kind of gets left unstated. Uh, thirdly, to increase the destruction of VC, Viet Cong, or the National Liberation Front, the Viet Cong is a pejorative term uh, originated by uh, No Dinh Diem, the uh, president of South Vietnam. Um, uh, um, the terms are, are really used interchangeably, National Liberation Front, Viet Cong, or VC. Uh, and the PAVN, the uh, People's Army of North Vietnam, so you have insurgent forces, South Vietnamese insurgent forces, are, uh, and as well as uh, regular Army North Vietnamese forces. And Westmoreland is supposed to destroy their base areas by 30%. Where are the base areas? Outside of South Vietnam. Where are the United States forces not oftentimes allowed to operate? outside of South Vietnam uh, proper. So there are issues in terms of ach achieving this based on the constraints that, uh, w under which Westmoreland is operating. Number four, increase the pacified population by 235,000. Why 235,000? Why not 250,000 or 500,000? And again, what does population, uh, um, what does a pacified population mean? If, if the goal of pacification is to link your rural population to your government, how do I assess that? I would argue that, in, uh, that we're, we are actually having a difficult time in our country assessing political um, parties and, and, and loyal, political loyalty. Um, how are the Americans supposed to do that for the South Vietnamese? Number five, ensure the defense of political and population centers under government control. What does control mean, again? Um, and finally, and this is where I think the word uh, attrition comes into play, a trip by year's end, VC PAVN forces at a rate as high as their capability to put men in the field, the so-called crossover point. But I think this conference is incredibly important for understanding how the, uh, the difficulties of measuring progress in Vietnam, that it's not solely about killing the enemy, because that's not what West, uh, Westmoreland is being asked to do. He's supposed to uh, look at increasing the population that's pacified. He's supposed to secure areas. He's supposed to somehow control areas. Um, and, and all of that is he's supposed to um, accomplish while he's fighting the enemy and while he's uh, supposedly uh, also as supp um, um, part of his mission to be strengthening and training the South Vietnamese armed forces. So I think that uh, this February 1966 conference is incredibly important for understanding um, not only the strategy in South Vietnam, uh, but also the difficulties of assessing progress because it is so broad. And this is where I think the literature for the last 20 to 30 years has, has failed us in a sense because it, it is looked at strategy in Vietnam, I think, too narrowly. Now, this will not change under uh, Richard Nixon, who uh, is elected in 1969 and takes office. He'll, um, um, he'll come in with a five-point strategy to end the war and win the peace, Nixon's ultimate objective, obviously, is to achieve peace with honor um, or a decent interval or both um, or maybe one without the other. Um, it's, it's, uh, it depends, I think, on when you ask. Um, but again, take a look at the, the, the broad uh, brush strokes of what Nixon's strategy um, is. And this is a review that's done um, actually as Nixon is getting ready to take office. Um, Kissing, uh, Henry Kissinger's National Security Advisor um, will will head a process that to reevaluate the war and Nixon will uh, formulate his five point strategy um, again it's focused on pacification which is a meaningful continuing security for the Vietnamese people diplomatic isolation so now we're moving uh, away from the battlefield proper and trying to assess how our battlefield um, accomplishments and the effectiveness of our battlefield uh, our military operations is having an influence on diplomatic negotiations Increasing the weight of uh, uh, negotiations in Paris, uh, 
gradual withdrawal of U.S. forces from Vietnam, Vietnamization. Are there problems here with measuring Vietnamization and measuring how well your allies are able to take over for you while you're trying to withdraw, withdraw from a conflict? Luckily, we don't have to deal with those problems today. Um, and then finally, uh, Vietnamization itself, which was aimed at training and equipment, equipping the South Vietnamese armed forces so they could defend uh, the country on their own. Again, I think a difficult proposition for Americans um, uh, under Abrams at this time period. Now, as I mentioned, uh, there's not a lot in, in the literature to, that deals with this problem. Um, in fact, um, I was, wasn't able to find all that much of on the contemporary literature that talked uh, all that much about counterinsurgency metrics and methods and indicators. Um, it, it really depended on, um, on your writer. Sir Robert Thompson, who is a, uh, a counterinsurgency expert uh, based on his experiences, uh, su supposedly successful experiences in Malaya, um, will establish criteria based on incident rates. Now, there's a problem with that, I believe. If I come into this area as an outside force, and after a certain amount of time, the level of violence decreases, does that mean that it decreases because I'm in charge? Or does that, uh, do the incident rates decrease because the insurgents are in charge? So if you are, say, the, the National Liberation Front commander of this, of this village, right? and you are absolutely certain that you, have, you, in fact, have control over the local population, would you bother firing on American soldiers? Probably not, because you're already in control, so why focus your efforts on the military option if you are in political control of this village? The incident rates will drop. Will I see that as an indicator of success for me as an American who doesn't have the language um, skills that are necessary to get a feel, who oftentimes is coming into this village with no um, ability to recognize what's, what looks right, what doesn't look right, and you, in fact, may move away from the military option and focus all of your efforts on the political because you just don't need to use the military, um, military option. And I think that, that is a problem um, in some of the early literature that talks about incident rates as a metric for progress. Um, now, there are certain... Um, um, uh, French officers at the time, David Galula uh, being obviously the most famous of these, uh, that will talk about political organization at the grassroots level. Again, it's difficult, I believe, for Americans to uh, understand what that means in the context of, uh, of South Vietnam. And I think one of the things that's important for understanding about the entire war is that this, this conflict that's going on inside South Vietnam, if not uh, in Vietnam as a whole, is really a context over what the society is supposed to look like, what the relationship between the government and people is supposed to look like. That there is, there is in fact, um, a revolution going on inside of South Vietnam over what this country is supposed to look like. And I think it's difficult, obviously, then for Americans to come in and assess political um, uh, uh, organization at the grass, grass, gr grassroots level. Now, um, Americans will increasingly come in and, uh, and make their own assessments. Uh, they'll look at the French experience. Again, I think there is um, uh, some simplicity in the literature that says the Americans will ignore the French uh, whole, whole cloth. I, I think that's a bit, um, a bit narrow. You do have a number of American officers. Uh, even here at, uh, at the Military History Institute, you can read a number of uh, Army War College students' papers that are looking at the French experience in Algeria, looking at the French experience in, in Indochina. Um, uh, Bernard Fall being the, uh, one of the, uh, the most famous of the um, South uh, East Asia experts talks about measuring administrative control as opposed to military control. What is administrative control? The ability of the National Liberation Front to tax its people or tax the, the, the local uh, villagers. Again, I think this is a bit because the Americans oftentimes won't have the ability to, to see deep inside uh, hamlets and villages to understand um, what type of influence the National Liberation Front has over that uh, village. And then, as I mentioned, as Americans will uh, increasingly come into uh, Vietnam, they'll start to, to develop their own metrics. Uh, one major, Robert Osborne, um, who's working in one of the northern provinces in the First Corps Tactical Zone, uh, 
uh, notes that if you go into a battle area and a villager comes along and warns you about mines along the road, to me, this is an indicator of success. Or if a villager does not warn the military, that's an indicator of failure. Or as one advisor late in the war maintained, the really meaningful success indicators are the smiles I see on the people's faces. I would argue that's a somewhat fickle indicator, the smile on the people's faces. Um, now what pr makes this problematic uh, even further is just the lay of the land itself. Um, and just as a, a quick matter of context, uh, Indochina is divided in 1954 after the Geneva Conference along the 17th parallel after the fall of Dien Bien Phu. Uh, in the north, communist supporters under, uh, will consolidate power under Ho Chi Minh. In the south, uh, No Dinh Diem wins over internal political, uh, an internal political power struggle, but certainly his base is not as, as uh, solid as, as Ho Chi Minh's is in the north. As I mentioned, MACV is created in February of 1962. Uh, the first commander is a gentleman by the name of Paul Harkins, uh, who was Patton's uh, uh, chief of staff of, uh, in the Third Army during World War II. He's very much a, uh, a product of his conventional experiences. Um, he is also a perpetual optimist. And again, I think one of the things, the themes that you see in the American experience in Vietnam is that commanders oftentimes, uh, oftentimes at all levels, will place a lot of pressure on soldiers and officers at lower levels to report progress. Um, and, and Harkins will actually say that to his staff. Um, I am an optimist and I don't want to see bad news. That seems to problematize uh, the accuracy of your reports. Um, and then as, uh, as I mentioned, the strategy is difficult, for, I think, for many American officers to conceive. Harkins himself will say uh, that it was something new to all of us. It was an entirely different type of military operation than we'd ever been on. There wasn't any front line. It was no place. It was every place. It was in your kitchen. It was in your backyard. In fact, it was in Harkins' backyard. His gardener, they found out, uh, his uh, staff found out, was a member of the National Liberation Front. Um, so it quite literally was in Harkins' backyard. Um, now, as, as Harkins uh, will give up command to William Westmoreland in 1964, I mentioned this, uh, this laundry list that is established in 1963. Uh, Directive 88, that, uh, that is a list of items to be counted and tabulated. But nowhere in that directive are any of those metrics linked to strategic or operational objectives. And I think this is problematic for the Army in Vietnam, that it has all these metrics, it has all these data points that they are collecting, and ultimately they're not really linked to any strategic objectives. And I, I think that is, a, um, in one sense, a bit of a failure for, from the staff and commanders in Vietnam. Now, of course, numbers will whet an appetite for more numbers. Um, if you've ever served on an Army staff today, Excel spreadsheets whet an appetite for more Excel spreadsheets, or PowerPoint slides whet an appetite for more PowerPoint slides. Um, and in fact, uh, there is concern that uh, they were, uh, these, um, these, these uh, numbers will, will overwhelm early on. Chester Cooper, who is a member of the National Security Staff, will say that numbers flowed into Saigon and from there into Washington like the Mekong River during the flood season. By 1964, this is even before the commitment of U.S. ground troops, there are roughly 500, 500 separate United States and South Vietnamese uh, reports. Data collection, even before the introduction of ground forces, American ground forces, is becoming an end unto itself. All right, so what I'd like to do now is make a transition into those three areas that I, I, I discussed uh, that I'd like to kind of give you some, some insights into problems in, in, in specific areas. First off is, uh, is the, the actual military um, operation piece here. Uh, and here we do see um, uh, Hal Moore in the aftermath of uh, this unprecedented victory in November 1965. Um, there is quite a bit of pressure to achieve high body counts. I think that is uh, that's certainly an important point to realize here. But not th that pressure for reporting success isn't just limited to uh, the military operation piece of it. Um, and I think that pressure occurs on a number of levels. Certainly, the US Army as a whole will, will receive pressure from the Johnson administration and from McNamara in particular. There is political pressure to show progress in a war. These progress reports, at times, will become politicized. Just the word progress itself 
connotes that you are, in fact, making progress. And I think that is somewhat problematic. Um, so there is institutional pressure. Um, but part of that is this belief that there's just no other way to get at understanding how well the U.S. Army is doing in Vietnam. This isn't an experience like World War II where you land on the, the Normandy beaches on 6 June 1944 and you are here. And then by July of 1944, after the St. Lowe breakout in Operation Cobra, you are here. And then you reach Paris and you are here. And then you reach the, um, the Franco-German border and you are here. And it's obvious to everyone. It's obvious to, to your forces, the enemy forces. It's obvious to... Um, to the, uh, the populations at large. Without any front lines in Vietnam, it becomes very difficult for politicians and military commanders to demonstrate that they are in fact making progress. And I think Americans general like to equate effort with progress, and I think that happened in Vietnam. There's an incredible amount of effort be exp being expended here. There is an expectation that that effort should be equaling progress. And in fact, McNamara will later note that we undertook the body count because it was one of Westie's objectives, again, the attrition piece, which was to reach the so-called crossover point. To reach such a point, we needed to have some idea that, um, that they could sustain uh, and what their losses were. So you, there's a sense of frustration here. That frustration, I think, is also linked to soldiers in the field. Americans are fighting certainly an elusive enemy in, 19, uh, in the 1960s in, uh, throughout South Vietnam. And again, this pressure on soldiers becomes immense. As one division commander will say, as a rule, when an outfit has a fight and does not get a high body count, it is not pushing the way it should. What message does that send to a young soldier? If you don't have a high body count, you're not pushing as hard as you should. What does that say to a young captain that's leading his company into battle? Um, but there's also something I think that's uh, um, a bit surreal about this as well that, that speaks to an individual basis. Um, not only are units um, struggling with, with, with measuring progress and, and, and linking their efforts to something tangible, but body counts fulfill some individual need for soldiers. As one said, there's nothing like a confirmed kill. They make you crazy. You want more. You know everybody back at battalion will look at you with envy when you get back in. You scored a touchdown in front of the hometown fans. Another uh, battalion commander who's talking in the, uh, the post-Tet uh, atmosphere will say that uh, and they, they were just receiving a new battalion commander and that new battalion commander says, maybe we'll run into some VC soon and get a good body count and morale will go up. So there is an intense amount of pressure here to report progress. And this is just one small slice of the war. I think you have institutional pressure. Uh, I think you have political pressure. And I think you actually even have a human pressure that soldiers want to uh, expend this effort and get something tangible out of it, as gruesome as that sounds. And in fact, it is. One division commander will recall that it is a gruesome way of accounting, but there doesn't seem to be any other way to keep track of the progress being made. So I think this uh, is an important piece to, re um, to understand uh, how the Americans are working through this, um, because pressure is important. And I'll give you one final example on this, um, because I, I think it speaks to um, uh, the larger problems of what happens to the numbers themselves. Uh, it is... Uh, um, it is late 1965, uh, and it, during the uh, nine-day siege of uh, Play Coup, which is a special forces camp, uh, and the siege finally gets lifted um, by an outside American force. Um, and the special forces uh, commander of this camp, um, uh, Major Charles Beckwith, um, is, is trying to clean up the battlefield to get a sense of what's going on. And... Um, Immediately, he's called by the, uh, the MACV chief of staff um, to ask for a body count. He hasn't even been outside of the wire yet. And he's telling, his, he's barking at his radio commander to tell them to get off my back. I haven't even been outside the wire. I'll, as soon as I get a count, I will send it up. Um, and, and Beckwith, to his credit, says, oh, look, I am not going to give a count until I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm fairly confident that I get, can give an accurate one. 
By the time this officer sends up, uh, reports 40 enemy casualties, the figure at the, uh, at the, that's announced in the Saigon press conference that day is five times that high. There is a problem here in terms of um, what the numbers, um, what, how the numbers are being used and misused, I think. Now, as I mentioned, um, the military operations are, are a piece of this. And certainly, I think Americans in general will look at this problem of counterinsurgency from a sequential view. I would argue we still look at it from a relatively sequential view, that we, we believe that population security, territorial security, security in general, must be achieved first, and after which we can, we can work on the pacification piece of it. But I think this cartoon speaks to the tensions between the destruction efforts that are going on in South Vietnam and the construction efforts. And the pacification piece of this is supposed to be the construction effort. But those two efforts, the military effort focused on destruction, the pacification effort focused on construction, oftentimes work at odds with one another. That will become problematic for those that are trying to assess uh, effectiveness as a whole for what's going on in the war. Now, in early 1964, uh, McPhee will, will, will work through a, a rough um, measurement system to evaluate security inside villages and hamlets. And what they do is, um, it's a really a color-coded process. If, a, um, if an area is blue, that means it's under, uh, uh, it's under friendly control. If it's white, it's contested. And if it's, under, if it's red, it, it means it's under enemy control. Again, the problem is, is that the data itself seems to be corrupt oftentimes. As one advisor is talking to, um, to his counter, South Vietnamese counterpoint, says, hey, we've got this blue area here. I want to go out and see it. And the Vietnamese immediately comes back and says, you can't go there. You'll get shot at. And yet that's what's being reported, that this is a blue area. Um, so there is a problem here, I think, in terms of garbage in and garbage out. Um, and the reliability of the data seems to be suspect. In fact, Westmoreland will talk about that um, not only in his memoirs, but at commander's conferences during the war, uh, that he's, he understands that the data that he's receiving as a commander um, seems to be unreliable. Now, ultimately, this, uh, this crude um, uh, color-coded process will, will lead to the Hamlet evaluation system, which is established in early 1967. And... Um, and what it's supposed to do is, is measure a number of different things. Here is an, an excerpt uh, from the Hamlet Evaluation System Worksheet. It is a, uh, a matrix of roughly 18 indicators in which to assess a Hamlet's security and development. And those are important uh, points to consider, security and development. So for a young advisor, a young American advisor, who, oh, by the way, likely does not speak um, Vietnamese, he has to um, factor in and assess... Um, Viet Cong military activities, the political and subversive activities, and friendly security capabilities. Again, all of these seem to be problematic. And then economic uh, development factors by assessing administrative, political activities, health, education, welfare. How does a young American 22-year-old 20, assess the health programs of a South Vietnamese village? Does a young American from New York City assess South Vietnamese health programs and education programs differently than a young American from, say, Idaho or Indiana? Do Americans assess this, using, using this Hamlet evaluation system, evaluate um, their villages and hamlets differently than other free world military forces like the Republic of Korea forces? Do Koreans look at the South Vietnamese differently than the Americans do? Obviously, I think they do. Um, and as I mentioned before, the problem, as you see, is despite all the numbers that are being used in this system, and they are, they're quite extensive, a lot of this is subjective. Um, the party apparatus, the political apparatus of the enemy, appears to be eliminated. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean that I can walk through this village securely during daytime, but I, I will not go out at night? And in fact, one uh, journalists will, will say that. A very uh, perceptive correspondent will ask, how secure is secure when U.S. officials brag that they can go anywhere in their province by day, but were reluctant to go anywhere in the outside the capital at, after dark? This one report alone, the Hamlet Evaluation System, which is supposed to assess uh, more than 2,000 villages and 13,000 hamlets, one report alone 
generates a monthly average of 90,000 pages of reports. How would you like to be the staff officer that has to read 90,000 pages every month? And oh, by the way, on the ground this becomes problematic because oftentimes the advisors that are filling these forms out have to, have to assess roughly um, 30 or so, 35 or so on average, um, hamlets and villages per month. Which means on the day one I go here, and day two I go here, and day three I go here. Well, how do I actually get an accurate assessment if I'm in and I'm out and I'm moving on to my next, um, uh, my next hamlet or village? Um, and these terms that I've talked about are, are flexible. Um, what does security mean? It is a relative term. And, uh, and it's, frus it's totally frustrating for Americans. Um, as one officer says, I wish people's ears would light up or something when we have won their heart and mind. Or as another officer put it, what we need is some kind of litmus taper that turns red when it's near a communist. Um, so you get a sense of this frustration among officers on the ground who are being asked to fill out these forms um, and are really struggling with what they mean um, and, and how to um, evaluate the subjective aspects of this war. All right, so there are problems in, uh, in the military operation piece. There are problems certainly in the pacification piece of it. And as we get farther in, along in the, in the war, especially under the Nixon administration, when uh, withdrawal becomes a policy, a, 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 a political policy, and Vietnamization becomes part of our strategy, then the uh, challenge becomes one of how do I assess how well the South Vietnamese forces are actually progressing? And are they ready to take over an area from Americans? Um, and this becomes problematic as well. Um, now, this is not a, a problem that's, uh, that's confined to the Abrams uh, years between uh, mid-1968 and 1972. Um, early on, the Americans are having difficulties in, in assessing how well uh, Arvin, the, uh, the South Vietnamese Army, is doing. A 1963 study, in fact, finds um, that Arvin, uh, as a whole, that um, in uh, July of 1963 had conducted a total of 4,475 small unit operations. So for one month, the fact that a South Vietnamese army is able to conduct over 4,000 small unit operations sounds impressive. But when you start digging through the numbers a little bit, you'll find, you found, or I found, um, that the report concluded that of those 4,475 operations, 175 actually made contact with the enemy. So this is an enemy that has the initiative, not only politically, I would argue, but also militarily. Um, there's also, obviously, um, um, an element of, of racial and cultural bias that is at play here. Americans oftentimes look down on their South Vietnamese allies. One Brigadier General in the 1st Infantry de uh, um, described it as such, that this business of getting mixed up with the Vietnamese, and he's talking about his allies here, was something that could get in the way of performing in a spectacular fashion. Many were absolutely, and he's talking now about other officers, were uh, completely insensitive um, to the local population, to the Vietnamese soldiers, and to the regional and popular forces. They were seen as just an obstruction. Well, how do you measure the effectiveness of your allies if they are seen as nothing more than an obstruction? Um, and again, I think this uh, goes down to the, uh, to the soldier level as well and is, and is oftentimes uh, lamented by commanders uh, in the press. U.S. News and World Report will, will run a story under the byline, Their Lions, Our Rabbits, talking about the Vietnamese, the uh, National Liberation Front being the lions, the Arvin forces being the rabbits. And certainly these, uh, the Vietnamese peasants, I don't think, fared any better in the, in the eyes of Americans. One soldier wrote home in July of 1969, I still can't believe how these people live. They're just like animals. They live out in the middle of nowhere. How does that young soldier writing home to his family uh, accurately, objectively, assess how well this army is progressing? Um, now, uh, as with uh, most other programs, we, uh, the United States forces in Vietnam will, will lean towards um, uh, 
um, quantifiable metrics. Um, an argument is made that uh, under Abrams, the body count kind of goes out the window as a metric. In fact, uh, uh, MACV staff will use the body count as a, as a significant indicator for, um, uh, for how well the uh, Arvin forces are operating. So the, some of the similar tangible aspects of the Army uh, operations in terms of weapons captured, uh, body counts achieved are still there. And um, uh, the evaluation reports for um, these South Vietnamese forces are equally um, um, overwhelming. The, um, the SEER, which is a system for evaluating the effectiveness of the Republic of Vietnamese Armed Forces, just the, just the title itself is overwhelming, um, is supposed to measure, or was supposed to measure, three broad areas of military performance, personal logistic uh, uh, statuses, and historical trends. And yet, yet again, it's problematic in terms of what officers are being asked to measure. This 157 question survey, which was supposed to be filled out on a monthly basis, uh, was called by one officer, one advisor, a multiple guess type of report. So um, to, to kind of wrap this up, I think um, uh, what I've hopefully shown in, a, um, in the limited time I've had here this evening is that the argument that the, the United States Army in Vietnam uh, lost because it was focused solely on attrition and focused solely on body counts, I, I think is off. Um, and I think if you look at the, the uh, American strategy in Vietnam more broadly and just take a look at the number of reports, I think that is, uh, um, offers some, uh, or at least suggests that um, the American strategy was more broad. But ultimately, I don't think... Um, that uh, the United States Army in particular in Vietnam, uh, and that was the focus, of, uh, by the way, of my, uh, my um, historical question was, was really the U U.S. Army in Vietnam rather than the Air Force um, or the Marines. Um, I, I think it, this problem ran the gamut of, uh, of American experience. Um, there's a famous uh, story of uh, Victor uh, Krulak, who was a, a Marine officer, and um, uh, Mendenhall, who was a Foreign, uh, from, uh, foreign Service or, uh, officer. Uh, they go on this uh, tour of Vietnam in, in uh, 1963, uh, in September. This is uh, just a few months before President Kennedy is assassinated. Um, and Krulak uh, and Mendenhall are in the White House. Uh, they're briefing President Kennedy and his senior advisors, and Krulak, the Marine officer, uh, says to, to Kennedy that the shooting war is going on ahead at an impressive pace. And Mendenhall immediately afterwards states that, he's, that he found a virtual breakdown of the civil government in Saigon as well as a pervasive atmosphere of hate arising from the police reign of terror. And when they completed both of the briefings, Kennedy looked at them and said, the two of you did visit the same country, didn't you? That problem, I think, works itself all the way throughout the American experience in Vietnam. Um, as Michael Forrestal, who, Forrestal, who's a member of the NSC staff, uh, notes, I cannot answer the question of whether we are winning or losing. The situation varies from place to place. Another report in, um, um, in, in the summer of 1968, so complex and overwhelming are the problems confronting South Vietnam that the nation's progress must be ju judged in terms of effort rather than achievement. Again, in 1970, um, that the government-sponsored measurements of success remained uh, one of a doctor who tries to judge the health of his patient by taking his own temperature. And finally, uh, reported by Time magazine um, in early 1970, for each good sign, there can still be found another less hopeful sign. And as a result, every assessment of the war is, is self-contradictory. And I think one of the uh, perspectives that, uh, that a, a study of this problem offers us is, is just this, that we need to be, uh, all of us, I think, careful about setting false expectations and using data to, to prove an argument, uh, whether it's a political argument or a military-based argument, for how well uh, our forces are doing in, in this type of very complex environment. Um, because ultimately, I don't think either the uh, civilian... Um, authorities and officials uh, under any of the um, administrations, Kennedy, Johnson, or Nixon, uh, and many of the military officers actually could trust their own statistics, and I, and I found that to be quite problematic. Uh, oftentimes, they were never really connected to the military activity that was occurring, or the political activity for that matter. They were never really integrated into one another. Um, and ultimately, I think 
um, um, it was a process of diversion more than anything else that these uh, that data collection rather than data analysis uh, became um, uh, became really the, the the overriding problem for the American Army, um, and ultimately I think that led to its inability to understanding understand how it was how well it was doing this type of environment. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. So I can't just leave. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Raise your hand, and we'll get a microphone to you, and we'll start with you, sir. I guess it's working. Yeah. Good evening, uh, Kyle Marsh, student uh, at the War College this year. Um, having just come out of Iraq three times and Afghanistan less than a year ago, I can tell you that we're still doing the exact same thing <clears throat> um, that you described, asking 22. No, no, no. Americans always learn from their own history, so we are not right. doing the same thing. Um, but, but I will tell you, um, as a battalion commander, uh, and I, I sensed it, and I've come to a conclusion, uh, and I'm, I'm curious if Westmoreland had a similar problem, uh, is that can soldiers objectively evaluate themselves in their own areas? Uh, and what I found time and time again is a unit that is departing will rate its development, will rate its uh, partnered unit at a much higher level because they are part of that solution. They are part of that problem. Exactly. And they want to go out feeling very good. The new unit comes in, and that assessment goes way to the left. Uh, and as I watched this, I wondered how does Petraeus, how does Crystal, how do they make hide nor hair of reports that are vacillating to the left and the right? And, and my question is... Um, Westmoreland, Westmoreland, having been there for so long, right. did he lose some objectiveness of where he really stood? That's a great question, uh, and, and I, would, uh, uh, I think my own experience kind of confirms that, right, that any time an officer comes into a unit, uh, any time a unit comes in to replace another one, uh, the situation is, is, is on the verge of collapse. And after my 12-month tour, we are, we are this short of victory. And then the next unit comes in, we're on the verge of collapse, and, and so on. Um, I think uh, that certainly did happen, and especially, um, I think, in the pacification uh, aspect of this, uh, in the, the advisory role. Um, because um, what I found in my research, and I, I think this kind of is borne out uh, with our experiences more recently as well, is that uh, oftentimes American advisors were very hesitant to, to rate their village or their unit, if they were a, a district advisor or a military advisor, too low, because it potentially undermine the relationship that they were, ha they were supposed to have to, to, um, in, in working together. Um, so I, I, I did actually find instances of that, and there was actually a, a discussion among uh, Westmoreland and, and his commanders at one, uh, one of the commander conferences about this. Um, now, I do think Westmoreland um, um, should receive a bit of credit. I, I think commanders in general back then, just as today, oftentimes get insulated but just by the size of their staff. If you take a look at any of the photographs of the MACV complex, it's, it's, it's huge. Um, and oftentimes, I think commanders will become insulated in that. And I think Westmoreland um, and Abrams, too, uh, for the most part, um, when he wasn't, no, I'm just kidding, um, um, did it try to... Um, to get out in the field to, to tamp down on that a bit. Um, but I, I certainly s I saw that phenomenon. Now, the difference, I think, is that um, because units stayed in, in, in place in Vietnam, for the most part, um, you didn't see as, as much of that uh, from a unit perspective, but certainly, I think, from an organizational perspective, uh, from a commander perspective. Uh, sir, on that side. <clears throat> on your last side here, slide here, you have false expectations impact of setting them. I just wonder, did anybody go in, is there a series of uh, reports of people going into a hamlet or village and just asking them what their expectations were? I guess that would be the same thing. And yeah, that's a great question. Why not, why not just ask right, them, right, what right. do you want? Right, and, right, right. Uh, maybe it, we can do it. There is a, uh, there is a, a new report um, that comes out uh, late 1969, early 1970 called the Pacification Attitude As uh, Assessment System, PASS. Um, and, but it was intended to do just that, um, to, to ask, the, uh, ask the local population um, what they felt about their relationship with the government, how they felt about the, um, the political struggle that was occurring in their village and, and whether the National Liberation Front had ascendance, was, was in the ascendancy or whether the government had control of that village. 
I think it changes over the war. I think um, um, I, I think by the time you get to, to I think arguably as early as 67, 68, I think many uh, in the rural population simply want the war to be over with. Um, and again, uh, part of the problem, I think, in terms of measuring effectiveness with this is oftentimes that the military operations are working against the ultimate goal. Uh, the military operations are, are causing high numbers of refugees. They're causing depopulation. Um, they're, 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 they're ripping apart the social fabric. Um, and that undermines the pacification effort. So I think that makes it even more difficult now because you can say that your military operations are going well because I, got, I have high body counts, but at the same time you're, you're, you're causing thousands of refugees and then you're undermining your ultimate goal of restoring some sense of relationship between the people and the, um, and the population. Other questions? Jeff, that's up. You mentioned a couple you times, this, you uh, you want to. how do you define security? Right. Uh, and it reminded me of the stuff I've read, which suggests that people living in what we consider the third world have a very different view of security, whereas <laughs> Americans think of security as our capacity to avoid a catastrophe. They tend to see their security as their capacity to recover from a catastrophe. And I'm wondering, sort of building on his question, is was there awareness that maybe we're, we're counterproductive because we go into a village and we drive away the cadre and we think we've secured the village, but in the process we destroyed the cache of rice, which to people in a subsistence economy is unimaginable. Right. Uh, was there any talk or awareness of this sort I, of problem? I think there was talk of it. Um, I, I, I think the implementation that... Um, was, was too problematic and, um, and I, I don't think was actually resolved by either Westmoreland or Abrams. I mean, Abrams, uh, at least according to, to some of the um, uh, more recent works that are out there, that Westmoreland, under, I mean, Abrams understands the war better than, Abr or Abrams understands the war better than and Westmoreland does. He has this one war concept. He sees uh, the war as a system because the enemy sees the war as a system and um, it's, it's Similar to, I think, how we, what we would talk about today in terms of lines of, lines of operation that uh, Abrams sees this as um, linking all these lines of operation together as a, as a system. Um, but again, I, I don't think that um, the implementation of that is ever resolved. And part of that as well is that it's not just MACV uh, and the military forces that are on the battlefield. It's the CIA, it's USAID. Um, it's a number of non-governmental non organizations. And all of those organizations have their own metrics. And oftentimes what you'll have in, in, uh, in a specific area is a CIA reporting one thing um, and, um, and MACV reporting something very different, even when it comes down to uh, just the, how many numbers of enemy there are. Um, there's this, this uh, famous order of battle controversy over how many, how many enemy are actually on the field of battle to begin with and, um, and how do we define that. Um, so I, I don't think that actually ever gets resolved, um, but I think it's an important point to to kind of consider when looking at this problem. Yes, sir. My question has to do with uh, Directive 88, when you spoke of with the six measurement yes. goals. Yes. Uh, was that particular uh, document passed through the Joint Chiefs? Did they act on it? Was it directly from uh, McNamara? And then what happened to it? Uh, right. Did it achieve any kind of implement implementing a doctrine that, or goals that passed on to the field forces, for uh, example? That's a good question. Uh, it, it, what I found in my research is that uh, th that initial directive, 88, um, uh, which is kind of this laundry list, um, never changes during the war or changes very little. So that, that directive that's uh, constructed in 1968 will go through a number of revisions throughout the war effort. Reading that, let any of that go, language go through. Right, right, right. Um, I, I don't think so, and I think um, 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 again, all this data collection doesn't re is, is almost for naught. That uh, often, very little of it is actually used to make assessments. Um, very little of it is is um, used to develop trends and, and do some type of trend analysis. Um, 
but I, I think it is important to note that, that this, this laundry list of, of metrics doesn't really change all that much. And that's important, I think, when you get to the Abrams era, when the, when the mission of, of, of the Military Assistance Command Vietnam changes under Vietnamization. And you have a, a mission change, and yet the metrics that are being used haven't been updated to, to coincide with that change of mission. Sir, first. Yes, could you uh, address the British experience in Malaya? Um, from, from the measurement piece of it? Yes, the uh, metrics piece and how they, uh, 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 impression of that campaign is they viewed themselves as being successful. They did, without a doubt. And uh, um, how'd, how'd they make that judgment? Um, Sir Robert Thompson, uh, who's the, uh, um, the head of the British uh, advisory mission in Vietnam, um, says it's successful. <laughs> and I don't mean to be flip here. I, I think one of the problems, uh, especially with using Malaya as, a, as, a, uh, as an example, and, and certainly uh, Westmoreland, before he takes command of, of MACV as, as deputy commander, will actually go to, go to Malaya with Thompson and finds that it's, it, the experience just isn't relevant to what's going on in Vietnam. And I think that's an accurate uh, assessment, um, that the Malayan Chinese uh, Communist Party is a diff different ethnic group than uh, the local Malayans. Uh, the British um, um, ultimately will offer, offer Malayan independence, which, which kind of pulls the rug out from the N MCP. There are problems um, with the implementation of Qing Pen strategy that oftentimes gets dismissed. Um, um, in, in say a, a work like John Noggle's Learning to Eat Soup with a Knife that all of that kind of gets taken out of the picture. Um, but at the time, Thompson is, is uh, I mean, actually has access to the White House. He's, he's that influential. Um, he's talking to both the Johnson administration and the Nixon administration and coming back and, and offering his own assessments on how well the war is going. Um, his book, uh, No Exit from Vietnam, which was published in 1968, is very condemn condemnatory of the American experience, saying that it's too focused on the military operation. It's, it's overly uh, effusive when it comes to, to the use of firepower um, and, and will continue to advocate for this Malayan um, success story. And much of it is focused, uh, that, that recommendation is focused on the interrelationship between um, the civil side of the house and the, and the military side of the house. And I think that's why you have uh, an organization like CORDS being established in 1967. Thank you. Um, in your research, do you know where this trend for the bureaucratization or politicization of uh, data uh, originates? Are you, is your contention it originates with McNamara, or is this something that developed in the interwar years after the, you know, after action reports to now all this other... Uh, I, I, I actually think it, 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 um, it's established earlier. We, um, if you recall, McNamara, um, before he's uh, um, the head of the Ford Motor Company, is a, uh, is a staff officer in the Mays Air Force and, and, and works in kind of the, this budding uh, arena of systems analysis and, and is kind of tracking um, bombing effectiveness under LeMay. Um, and, and then I think uh, once you get to the static phase of the Korean War, you start to see uh, heavy use of body counts as, as a metric um, um, use, being used by Americans. Number of rounds being um, expended by artillery, number of uh, bodies being, um, so I, I think it actually happens earlier. Now what you do have in the late 1950s and early 1960s is this belief that uh, not only systems analysis can be used as a tool to assist military commanders, but also computers. Um, and what I found in my research was there's kind of a generational divide. That you had many co uh, senior commanders, um, especially at the Joint Chiefs, uh, Chief, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff level like LeMay at the time, um, who are very condemnatory of, of the whiz kids um, and saying that you can't rely on system analysis, you have to, you have to rely on the commander's judgment. Um, and I, there, there was a number of articles, uh, actually there was a conference here in the early 1960s uh, on the use of computers and system analysis as a tool for the commander. So there was a bit of generational divide occurring. Um, but there is this belief um, in the early years that, that these tools can be used to, to assist. Um, 
with a war effort, and I think what you have is this just kind of explosion that occurs. Uh oh. <laughs> this is almost a softball, but don't good. Worry. I'll take it. Uh, you've concentrated mostly on the in theater mech directed, yes. no pun intended, uh, data collection. Could you speak to the transmission? of data to Washington and the analysis and publication of analyses from the DOD level? Um, th there is a, uh, there's a systems analysis office in DOD. Um, 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 Thomas Thayer is one of those um, and is, is doing kind of a parallel efforts in terms of, of measuring how well the war is going. What I found though is a lot of that data actually never really left theater. Um, that, uh, that DOD uh, will send system analysis to Saigon, um, but it, it, it goes to computer banks oftentimes in Thailand and will we'll almost kind of stop there. And, um, and what then you have is, is these missions of, of, of senior civilian officials uh, and military officers going to Vietnam, looking, doing a two, you know, one to two week tour and then coming back and reporting on the war effort. Um, so what I found in, in one sense is that all, there's all this data collection effort, but it never is really being used by the decision makers in Washington, D.C., um, which again seems to be a bit problematic that if you're doing all this collection, um, and not only are you, are you not doing a very good job of analyzing, but the ad analysis that you are doing isn't really being used by decision makers, then there, there seems to be a, uh, that seems to be a broken prog uh, process, obviously. Uh, you emphasized a couple of things. One of them that was that uh, simply the volume of data that they attempted to collect made it almost impossible to make any use of any of it. Uh, and the other was they asked a lot of questions that were very hard to answer, yes. particularly hard to answer with a number. Right. But I wonder if the biggest problem wasn't integrity and the fact that you, you created a culture in which there was pressure to report something that the people who were reporting it knew wasn't true. Right. There was a culture where the people in the field knew they were filling out certain kinds of forms, reporting certain information, and then realizing that what they said in Saigon about what those reports were was, right. was a lie. Right. And that that really undermined what's fundamental to making an army work, right. being able to trust your colleagues. And it's not even occurring just at the army level. As I would argue it's occurring at the, at the uh, Department of Defense level well, as well. I, I, I'd like to make the argument that there's really two Robert McNamara's that are fighting in Vietnam. There's a public Robert McNamara that is going out and saying we're making progress, we're doing well, and there's a very private McNamara who as early as December 1965 is, is concerned that, that this may not actually be winnable um, and ultimately will, will be at odds with the Johnson administration and kind of quietly move to the World Bank. Um, so I, I think it's, it's that, that integrity piece of it I think is, is a challenge not only for the Army as an organization, but I think of the, the whole process as well. And again. Uh, we, we, I think I mentioned it. I mean, this, this quotation here from Westmoreland, it, it's, it's on a salesmanship tour, right? Uh, Johnson brings back uh, Westmoreland. He brings back Ambassador Ellsworth Bunker. They go on Meet the Press. They, uh, Westmoreland speaks to a joint session of Congress. He has this famous quotation where you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and then all of a sudden there's this huge credibility gap with uh, this nationwide offensive at Tet in January and February 1968. Other questions? Sir, first, I, I just wanted to make a comment, since I was one of those analysts, <laughs> that I, at the time, this was a pre-chaos theory world, yeah. and that linear physics and what was the, was the day, Isaac Newton rule, and we knew that if we had enough data, we could build a model that would allow us to figure out exactly when the war was over. I mean, that's, that was really the issue. And we didn't appreciate complexity and chaos and how difficult it is for linear systems to actually work in the real world. So there was a need to get that data to build the models that were needed to predict when the war was over and when we were, and when we were gonna win. So it's a, it's a little presentist to right. be able to think that we should have understood that that much data was gonna overwhelm us. Yeah. That much data we needed to build the models. And, and we got stuck in that trap. So what, what did the model say in terms of the end? We didn't have enough data. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. As, as somebody who filled out those Hamlet evaluation reports, 
uh, at the district level, there was only one question that you have to answer correctly to figure out security. Where did the village chief or the hamlet right. chief spend Sleep the night? At night? Right. Simple. And we all knew that. But that was the acid test. Mm -hmm. How about our allies? How about the Australians and the Thais and the Koreans? Um, were they collecting data like mad like we were? Or, and what were they doing with their data? Uh, it's a great question. I don't know. Um, I, uh, I, I didn't have access to those files. Um, I, the only reports I, I read um, uh, were some, uh, some accounts of, of Koreans when it came to pacification and how they assessed, as I mentioned earlier, the, you know, they, they had different um, benchmarks, if you will, when it came to assessing the health um, or uh, medical services, uh, cleanliness, that kind of thing, from with the economic development. But I, I never, uh, I never got into the uh, the free world military forces um, just because it was outside my view. I, I, that actually would be a pretty interesting question to see if, if we're if our allies are kind of following along with us in terms of uh, at least the the process and, and the way they're approaching the problem. Got time for one more? Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. Chuck Allen here. I'm a uh, operations researcher and some other uh, leadership instructor at the War College. My question comes up now is, so you're looking at history of finding out what happened in terms of developing these metrics and how they weren't useful. What did you discern as a, an appropriate way or process for having methods and metrics that are effective for right. leaders? It depends. Um, and actually, I, 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 I don't mean to be too flippant. I actually believe that to be the case. Um, and the more I've kind of thought about this, and I, I purposely kind of left that out of the end of the story because I didn't want to, to make an assessment that, well, they should have been measuring this and they should have been measuring that. Um, but I think um, the best way to do this, I think based on my own research, is that you have to look at, you have to look at the problem and you have to assess the problem locally. Now that becomes problematic when, when a general gets asked a question, well, general, how's the war going? And you can't say, well, it's going fairly well here in the Mekong Delta, but not so well in the Central Highlands, and it's going well here militarily, but not politically, and if you compare that to, there, there's just not enough, um, that, 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 that assessment piece of it, I think, becomes problematic. In an environment um, like a, a mosaic environment like Vietnam, I would argue like Afghanistan as today as well, um, that, that broad brush assessments just simply don't work. The problem is that I think in our, in our news culture, especially today, and I think you kind of saw that as well in Vietnam, that journalists had a very difficult time answering that question of how is the war going in the confines of a newspaper article or a, or a, a TV segment. Um, there's a wonderful uh, book out on... Um, um, on war in the Congo that came out last year or the year before, and I was listening to the author on NPR. He's a correspondent. He's been in the Congo for years. And he said one of the challenges that these uh, journalists have in the Congo is, is just explaining uh, what's going on and being able to do so in, in the confines of a, of, of, of a news dispatch, that uh, just explaining the government and, and the insurgency and how the, interrelation, and the interrelationships of those uh, two forces, um, just explaining the, the context is so difficult that that's why the Congo is oftentimes off our radar because you, they just can't explain it in a way that is intelligible in, in a newspaper report or, or a dispatch. And I, I think r roughly the same thing happened in Vietnam. So the challenge, I think, is, is measuring the mosaic and measuring the, the, the locality or the progress that are, that are made in the localities without... Um, um, without doing too much of a broad brush and, and just oversimplify. And oftentimes when you oversimplify, I think um, you do kind of set these false expectations because of these pressures to say, well, it's not going here and here all that well, but, but we are making progress. Um, and I, I think that's a bit difficult. 